Hello everyone, welcome to MBBS classes. Myself, Dr. Hanifa. Today in this video, I'll be talking on cochlear implant. The topics which we are going to cover is what cochlear implant is, a little short history of the cochlear implant, the different components which make up a cochlear implant. Now the, we'll see how the cochlear implant works, how to evaluate the patient's in the preoperative period. Then lastly, we are going to discuss about the candidacy criteria in adults and the children. And lastly, the contraindications for cochlear implant surgery. In this video, we are not going to cover up the surgery and the complications. That will be taken in another video. The cochlear implant are one of the implantable hearing devices that has fundamentally changed the treatment of the therapeutic that has fundamentally changed the treatment options of the patients for severe to the profound hearing loss. The cochlear implants, these are the electronic devices that contain a current source and an electrode that is implanted in the cochlea. And here the electrical current is then used to stimulate the surviving auditory nerve fibers. So here the Auditory nerve fibers, they are stimulated electrically, they are not stimulated acoustically. Now, a little bit a short history about the cochlear implant. So, as per the literature, the first idea of the idea of stimulating the auditory nerve is not new. It was back in the year 1800 that Sir Alessandro Volta he described a sensation that is a boom within the head. This one, he first reported that the electrical stimulation by the metal rods he inserted within his ear created an auditory sensation. And then he described this auditory sensation as a boom within the head. Then in, in the year around 1950s, according to the literature, the first cochlear implant was by the Andre de Giorno and Charles Iris in Paris. What happened that time when they placed a wire on the auditory nerve of some patients undergoing some ear surgery, the patient reported a clear auditory perception. And this observation by these two, it led to the impetus to the other surgeons. And later on, the work by other surgeons like Sir William F. House, Howard House, then F. Flair Simmons and Robin Mickelson, they worked very hard in this er area of cochlear implantation and finally the cochlear implant came into the market. In the initial days, the acceptance of the implant was very slow due to the concern about its safety and the efficacy. But with time, the science and technology it won the race and the first single channel cochlear implant was introduced in the year 1972. Later on, the multi-electrode prosthesis were introduced by the two groups, UCSF group and the grahams clark groups. And these two groups, they resulted in the production of the advanced bionics clarion and the cochlear uh, corporation's nucleus devices. So these are the two devices uh, of the cochlear implant which is available. Now coming to the components of the cochlear implant. So remember the cochlear implant it has two components. The external component which we see, which we can see and the internal component which is implanted inside the cochlea. So the external hardware, it consists of a microphone. This is the microphone. Then the next component is the speech processor and third is the transmission system. And the internal hardware, it consists of a receiver stimulator and an electrode array. This transmission system, which is a part of the external hardware and the receiver stimulator, they are aligned together and they are held in place by external and the internal magnets. This, this is the, uh, in the internal hardware, this is the electrode array, which is implanted in the, audit, in the cochlea and it stimulates the auditory nerves electrically. Now, how it works? So, we have seen that the microphone, which is a part of the external hardware. So, the 
sound and the speech in the environment is picked up by the external microphone then later on what happens this information is sent to the speech processor these informations which are picked up by the microphone they are converted into electrical signals by the circuit of the speech processor then these electrical signals are sent across via the radio frequency transmission system to the internal receiver stimulator so these external radio frequency transmission system and the internal receiver stimulator they must be aligned together so that the electrical signals they can transmit transcutaneously then this receiver stimulator it decodes the electrical signals and the signal is finally delivered to the electrodes which are positioned within the cochlea and this if these electrodes then they stimulate the auditory nerve and the sensation or the signal it passes on to the auditory cortex so this is how a cochlear implant works so the external hardware is doing the job from pickup by the ex uh, microphone to the transmission of the electrical signals via the radio frequency transmission system and the rest of the work is done by the internal hardware so whenever we are planning a patient for cochlear implantation the patient must be evaluated thoroughly because and this preoperative evaluation is a multidisciplinary task and is a very important part of the implant process so what is the purpose the purpose always remember it is to determine whether the patient is medically fit for undergoing surgery or not to determine if the patient is audiologically suitable for a cochlear implant then we need to compare the pre and the post implant status and it also helps us to evaluate the efficacy of the device which is used so the components of the preoperative evaluation are remember there are four components the first is the medical evaluation and the physical examination the second is the autological evaluation the third is the radiological evaluation and there are certain other additional evaluations which we'll discuss further under the medical evaluation our aim always is to obtain a complete medical history and the physical examination the purpose is definitely to de determine whether the patient is medically fit to undergo surgery then to identify the cause of the hearing loss whether the patient the hearing loss is a part of any syndrome or not and to verify the status of the immunization then when we are taking a history of the patients we must take and and rule out the history of meningitis especially in a cochlear implant candidate the reason is any history of meningitis it may lead to the cochlear ossification and cochlear fibrosis and the presence of cochlear ossification and cochlear fibrosis sometimes it may necessitate the modification of the surgical technique of the cochlear implant then we must try to find out the conditions that may interfere the post implantation rehabilitation like when we are talking to the patient's family then we we have you have to note down how is the motivation of the family the commitment of the family because the it is not only the surgical part the rehabilitation part is equally important of the after the cochlear implantation so the motivation and the commitment of the family it plays a crucial role in getting the optimal result following an implant so when we are examining a patient of hearing loss which is plan for the cochlear implant surgery then we must look for certain features which are suggestive of or which are associated with the syndromic deafness so i'll just go through the the different components of the syndromic deafness so we have to look for the presence of any brachial cleft pits cyst and fistula then any preauricular sinus telecanthus heterochromia then white fold lock then presence of any profound myopia or pigmentary retinopathy with deafness it should arise the suspicion of the syndromic deafness then goiter pigmentary anomalies and the craniofacial anomalies in children 
with congenital hearing loss the most common cause is genetic and as per the data around 60 to 80% of the patients with the congenital hearing loss they are autosomal recessive gene is responsible and out of these children 30% of them are syndromic so we must see the different conditions associated in the syndromes now coming to the audiological evaluation of a patient the audiological evaluation again you can say we have to subdivide it into three categories the most important being the audiological case history in the medical examination we have seen how to take the history from the medical aspect now we have to take a history from the audiological aspect then we need to do the audiological test and thirdly the autological examination in the audiological case history we have to note down the age of onset of the hearing loss in children with the congenital hearing loss they will be having the problem since the birth so this age of onset is important whether the onset is prelingual that means before the development of speech and language or it is postlingual then the duration of the profound hearing loss for how much duration of time the patient was deprived of the hearing we you must note down the progression and the bilaterality of the hearing loss then while history taking pay attention to the perinatal problems which are associated with the hearing loss like meningitis hyperbilirubinemia and the other causes associated with the sensory hearing loss then in adults the and adults and the young children the other risk factors must be taken into account like history of noise exposure autotoxicity trauma then you must find out the he hearing aid used prior to the implantation whether the patient used any hearing aid or not a family history of hearing loss is important and try to get the details about the symptoms which are suggestive of the vestibular dysfunction like delayed walking difficulty in maintaining balance and difficulty in riding cycle so if these are present then it goes to the inner ear anomalies so we have seen that the age of onset in children the most common congenital cause is genetic however in adults there are causes which are more common cause of hearing loss are pressed by acquiescence otosclerosis meniere's disease sometimes it happens after surgery also so when we are taking a case history of a patient we must try to find out the cause of the hearing loss next coming to the audiological test the audiological test it includes we have to take the aided and the unaided pure tone ear and bone conduction thresholds then we must take the aided and the unaided speech reception thresholds speech detection thresholds then auditory brain stem response testing is also uh, should be done others which are important are part of the audiological test battery are autoacoustic emissions and emittance testing including the tympanometry and the acoustic reflux these unaided thresholds are obtained in each ear individually however the aided thresholds may be obtained monoaurally or biaurally so after doing the test what are the who is the audiological candidate for undergoing cochlear implantation so the patients are with the bilateral severe to profound hearing loss with unaided three frequency pure tone average of 70 decibel hearing loss or poorer in the better ear and when the speech discrimination score is less than 50% in the ear which is to be implanted so the last component of the audiological evaluation is the autologic examination so the main aim is to identify the any presence of external and the middle ear diseases but remember even a patient with a csom is not a contraindication for the surgery there are multiple protocols for the management of csom with the cochlear implant so some surgeons they prefer in the most of the surgeons they prefer surgery in a stage wise manner like to take care of the csom first and the cochlear implantation at a later stage now coming to the radiological examination of the cochlear implant 
radio imaging is an important part of the preoperative evaluation and both high resolution ct scan and mri of the temporal bone is needed for the preoperative evaluation so the importance is after studying the hrct on mri of the temporal bone and it guides the surgeon to decide the site of implantation it helps us to decide the surgical approach the type of the device and the type of the electrode to be used after after studying the temporal bone anatomy in some of the uh, temporal bone radiology it might give us information on the cause of the hearing loss because the congenital deafness they are often associated with the other cochlear malformations so if there is any dilated vestibule or wide vestibular aqueduct cochlear hypoplasia or common cavity if the presence of these findings it goes towards the congenital deafness then imaging in the post operative period may also be used to evaluate the device placement so when when we are studying the ct scan and the mri of the temporal bone what what are the informations you must gather so remember we have to see the anatomy of the inner ear we see look for the patency of the cochlea cochlea facial nerve is important while performing the surgery you have to assess the size of the facial recess the presence of the cochlear nerve remember the presence of the cochlear nerve uh, for the cochlear nerve the mri is a better test then to find out the location of the large mastered emissary veins which may create problem while undergoing surgeries the height of the jugular bulb and the thickness of the parietal bone the thickness of the parietal bone is important in the pediatric uh, patients because uh, we have to implant the receiver stimulator now the conditions radiological conditions we can say very clearly where the cochlear implant is contraindicated is when there is an absent cochlear nerve and absent internal auditory canal otherwise in or in other conditions even though the patients are ha is having any other anomalies the cochlear implant can be done but if there is absent cochlear nerve and internal auditory canal it is a strict contraindication for undergoing surgery so i was talking about the other additional evaluations so it includes the speech and the language evaluation and the psychological evaluation too because these two important evaluations it provides information in determining the candidacy and it also helps us in the rehabilitation process the speech and the language evaluation it is done by the speech and the language pathologist with the experience of working in adults or children with the hearing loss what they do is they use the standardized assessment method to determine if the patient's current level of communicative ability is proper to undergo the surgery or not then it helps us to determine the candidacy of the patient and to assess the predictive outcome in the post implantation time the psychological evaluation is done by a psychologist or a social worker how they help is they help us by identifying the underlying or the hidden issues that could affect the implantation rehabilitation process and they also help us to mitigate the unrealistic expected outcomes from the cochlear implant candidates the psychologist and the social worker the evaluate by both verbal and the non verbal observation of the patient and the family members now coming to the candidacy criteria let's see the criteria in the pediatric age group so nowadays the infants from 12 months to 17 years of age can be implanted the criteria is the the, the patient must be having the profound bilateral sensory neural hearing loss unaided pta thresholds more than or equal to 90 decibel hearing loss minimal benefit from the hearing aids there should not be any evidence of central auditory lesions presence of the auditory nerve and no other contraindications for the surgery in pediatric age group there are other factors which also determines the candidacy criteria they are family support motivation and realistic expectations by the 
patients and the candidate. Then the rehabilitation and the additional support that facility must be available so that the patient can develop language, speech and the hearing. So these are the candidacy criteria in the pediatric age group. In the adult age group, the criteria goes like this. The patient must be having the severe or profound hearing loss with the pure tone average of 70 dB hearing loss. Then use or trial of appropriately fitting hearing aids. So they must be using at least the hearing aids for at least one to three months. Then the speech aided scores should be less than 50%. Again, the presence of the auditory nerve and the absence of any central auditory lesion is a criteria for both pediatric and the adult age group. And finally, no contraindications for surgery. Now let's see the contraindications for the cochlear implant. If we see that the main radiology it is mainly the radiology which determines the contraindications so the first is the cochlear nerve aplasia which is confirmed by the appropriate testing suppose if we get in ct scan a narrow internal auditory canal then the patient must undergo the mri to confirm the presence of the cochlear nerve aplasia then the other contraindications are the cochlear aplasia Michael's deformity. So here you can see that the two CT images. In the upper one is the cochlear aplasia. Here the patient is having the absent cochlea with the normal semicircular canals. And if you see the second picture below, this is a CT image of a patient with the Michael's aplasia. This Michael's aplasia, it is due to the developmental arrest of the otic capsule during the third in gestational week. And here the patient, they have the complete absence of the inner ear structures. So if presence of cochlear aplasia or Michael's aplasia is a contraindication for the surgery. And finally, the deafness of the central origin. The other relative contraindications are like cochlear nerve hypoplasia, bilateral cochlear ossification, and psychiatric pathology. So today in this video, we have seen the different parts of the cochlear implant, how it works, the preoperative evaluation, candidacy of the cochlear implant, and the contraindications. The surgery part we'll discuss in another video. With this, I come to an end of this video. Thank you for watching this video.